The late 80s and early 90s were a revolutionary time for anime and manga. This era of creatives gave us works such as Berserk, JoJo's Part 2, Dragon Ball Z, Game of the Fireflies, Hajime no Ippo, and fucking Akira. Every work I just listed was either adapted or written during this relatively short time frame. If it isn't obvious enough, this period of anime holds a very strong influence on the industry even to this day. They are all titans in their own respects. The stories of Hajime no Ippo and Berserk are still being written down and explored 20 years later. Dragon Ball Z went on to become one of the most influential anime ever. Akira is still held up as a masterpiece and absolutely adored by critics and audiences alike. Hell, as we speak, anime has gone so mainstream that JoJo's Part 6 is being released exclusively on Netflix for Western viewers. This is something that I could have never imagined maybe five years ago. In an era that cranked out this sort of magic, it'd be hard to stand out or truly display your exceptionality. But let's explore the story of a young mangaka who faced this creative challenge head on. Hitoshi Iwaki, born in Tokyo, Japan, had drawn and doodled ever since childhood. It was in his high school he realized he wanted to become a manga artist. This was in large part thanks to the influence of Usama Suzuka, known for his work on Astro Boy or Dororo, and also just being one of the most influential figures to ever grace this medium. In 1984, while he got his start in the industry as an assistant to the late Kazu Kamimura, the following year, he published a one-shot centered on environmentalism called Gomi no Umi, and won an award for his work. He would go on to write a couple more short stories such as Unfinished and The Day of the Ring, but his first true manga series went by the name Fuko no Iro Mize. Fuko in the Cafe was a four volume slice of life romance manga series about a girl named Fuko attempting to overcome her shyness and social anxiety. It was published between 1986 and 1988, failing to garner any significant attention. 34 years removed from the original publishing of Parasite, and 8 years removed since the anime adaptation, Parasite finds itself cemented amongst the group of anime I had mentioned earlier. Despite that, I still don't think it gets the praise it truly deserves. Yes, it does get lionized and receive copious amounts of adoration, but I can't help but feel it still lives in the shadows of all the other works produced in this era. A lot of fans of this series are interested because of the show's aesthetic rather than any of its substance. So in honor of Parasite and all its accomplishments, I'm going to use the runtime of this video to analyze and review the anime. I have a lot to say about Iwaki's work and Madass's adaptation, from the surprisingly unique soundtrack to its extremely consistent writing, its well executed animation, and its amazing cast of characters, I'm going to be going as in depth as I can. And of course, I will be giving it a score by the end of the video, so enjoy the video because I promise you, I enjoyed making it. Parasite is a sci-fi horror that sees an otherwise normal world upended by the arrival of parasitic aliens that can only survive by burrowing into the brains of organisms. These creatures can morph their appearances freely and have a biological drive to eat humans. Our protagonist Shinichi Izumi finds himself falling victim to one of these parasites, but doesn't lose control of his body due to the parasite failing to reach his brain. The parasite, named Migi, is now stuck playing the role of Shinichi's right arm and finds itself having to rely on Shinichi to stay alive. Shinichi and Migi find themselves codependent on each other and must coexist in order to survive in a world of parasites bleeding in with humanity. And with that little synopsis out of the way, I'm gonna discuss some of the aspects of why I love the storytelling in this anime. I told myself I would stop doing episode by episode breakdowns of anime because we don't want another Money Filter Code Geass rant duology. But for the sake of this show, I'm gonna analyze the first episode just to make a point. Parasite is one of my favorite pilot episodes in an anime, period. I haven't seen a show so effectively hook me in with good pacing and a relatively unique concept like this show. I'd be really surprised if this show did not steal any first time viewers attention within the first couple minutes. The opening. 
The opening is a woman having her entire head eaten whole by some strange monster alien masquerading as a human being. Okay, that's the fucking way you're starting off the show. Then we get this crazy metal opening with a crazy dizzying amount of characters, more of the same weird looking alien things, and a lot of content you'll only understand if you actually watch the show. This is another way to grab your interest. Maybe you want to know what's actually going on with the shit you see in the opening. And if you listen to the actual lyrics, it definitely adds the weird factor. After such an intro, we're immediately presented with a typical dorky looking protagonist who has a weird voice talking to him. That's odd considering he's the only one in the room, and keep note everything I've described is within the first three minutes. But the show doesn't really want to give you a break so it keeps ramping things up. First, Shinichi complains about his hand feeling off when he's at the dinner table. Nothing too crazy. But then you watch Shinichi almost instinctively block Murano's hand when she tries to jokingly hit him from behind. Okay, that's a little bit weird. But then you see this relatively mild-mannered protag decide to grab her tit? Alright, maybe Shinichi's a dork with a side of sexual harassment. We got plenty of those in the gaming community. Worst case scenario, if you're a seasoned anime veteran, you might have just assumed this was typical weird anime sexual harassment moment. Or maybe there is something wrong with his hand. But then, cut forward to a scene where he's falling asleep in class. We can see Shinichi using his phone with that same hand while he's sleeping. After this escalation, there can't be any doubt that this man's hand is acting on its own. Something is fucking wrong. And that's when we get a well-timed flashback showing Miggy's original attempt to take over Shinichi's body. So we, the audience, finally have an answer as to what the fuck is going on. Each action of Shinichi's hand got progressively more strange, with the author increasing absurdity each time. But then, as if the author was not satisfied, he decides to escalate one more time. This time, with Shinichi spotting a child about to get hit by a car, and then Shinichi springs into action to save the child by stopping the car with his bare fucking hand. And then he looks at his hand just to see that there's an eye slowly fading away. After stopping a moving gas fueled 2,000 pound death machine with his bare hand, and it's not clear to both the audience and Shinichi that something is wrong. And I guess my main point in saying all this is, this is a really brilliant way of introducing the parasite in Shinichi's arm. The amount of build up and tension this show accomplished in just a couple minutes is absurd. At first you could possibly deny the problem in his hand, but things get worse to the point where the narrative makes it undeniable. And that's how you capture someone's attention in a fucking pilot. This is the type of pacing the anime keeps throughout its runtime. Upon my numerous rewatches of Parasite, there's one thing that stands out to me, and it's the show's commitment to setting things up way ahead of time. The problem with a good amount of anime entrenched with action scenes is that they tend to be purposely vague and loose with their own rules. Anyone who's watched the popular shonen can attest to this fact. I don't think I need to go into the numerous examples. I mean, just watch Sword Art Online. Kirito, that nigga is a walking deus ex machina, I don't know what to say. But Parasite? Parasite impresses me because it never resorts to cheap tricks or stretching its rules in order to reach any of its conclusions. In fact, the show makes a habit of laying shit out to the audience beforehand. A poorly written show would simply not reveal certain rules until after a fight or when it's convenient in order to avoid constraining themselves, but Parasite doesn't go down this route at all. In episode 4 we see Miggy separate himself from Shinichi and it's played up as some sort of gag. Sure the scene is sort of a joke in the moment, but it plays a very important role in establishing that Miggy can actually separate himself from the host, albeit he can only do that separation for a limited amount of time. It's really essential that this is explained as early as it is, because when Miggy actually does make use of this ability 19 episodes later, it doesn't feel like an ass pull. It's something we should have been expecting at some point as a tool inside him and Shinichi's arsenal. 
We can also observe this with Shinichi's resurrection. It never feels like bullshit because from episode 2, the possibility of shifting to another body part was already established. It's repeatedly referred to as dangerous, but it's a possibility nonetheless. I love the death and resurrection of Shinichi because it's an example of a protagonist being resurrected without bullshit awful reasoning. It's not a retcon, it's not do sex machina, it's not shonen power or friendship. It's just cold hard science fiction that follows the rules and parameters of the show, all while not feeling forced or convoluted. The biggest criticism you can throw at this is the parasite walking away after stabbing Shinichi in the heart, especially after the parasite was criticizing themselves after realizing they did not finish off Shinichi's dad. However, there's a multitude of justifications for this. Namely the fact that Shinichi died instantly and there was just no way that Parasite could know Miggy was going to give up part of its cells to restore Shinichi's heart. Parasites aren't all-knowing creatures and this one doesn't seem to be one of the smart ones anyway. And it should be noted, this same Parasite later comments that they should have cut the head off, acknowledging their mistake. Do you see how the most basic criticism I could have come up with falls apart with thinking and observation? Listen, if there's a limit to how you can call out someone's bringing back a character to life scene, I think you've done a good job. The other thing Parasite seems to do very well is keeping things exciting by knowing how and when to scale power. This isn't an action anime, rather an anime that happens to have action scenes. So it doesn't have to rely on spectacle or substance to entertain the viewer. A common issue we run into is a mangaka getting undisciplined and having to repeatedly raise the stakes. Anyone who's watched enough anime can easily list out examples of this. Goku has pink Super Saiyan hair and that nigga Boruto has to say like 10 words before he can cast a Rasengan. But in Parasite, we consistently see a Waki tinkering with the rules and taking action to make sure things stay fresh. For example, after Shinichi gets revived and part of Miki merges into his heart, he quickly finds out he's basically a goddamn superhuman now. This is pretty cool of a development for both the overall narrative themes in the story and for making the fights more entertaining. But Iwaki is smart and reels it in by also adding a trade off. Shinichi has heightened physical abilities and sentences now, but Miggy also has to rest for 4 hours in the day now. So that means for 4 hours in the day, Shinichi can be sneak attacked. He cannot detect the enemy. He's more vulnerable. He gets no warning from Mickey. Sure, Shinichi is stronger now, but he now has a heightened sense of fear in those moments Mickey goes to sleep, and this sleep can happen at very inconvenient times. And this change is overall good for keeping tension because we do get those moments where Shinichi can't detect the enemy due to Mickey's sleep. And the writing is not just intelligent with keeping Shinichi in check, there's some smart moments where they keep the parasites in check. On the face of it, Humans don't stand a chance against parasites, but then we get the genius of the show. Researchers and government agents tasked with investigating and fighting the parasites come up with a method to detect the parasites, and it involves simply pulling their hair. The government then turns hair pulling into a sort of social phenomenon that I can only imagine makes the parasites absurdly uncomfortable. And this doesn't feel like an ass pull because of earlier dialogue from Miggy. Remember Miggy when he was explaining the process of splitting up his body? He makes clear that the further he splits up, the smaller each pieces, the less capable his cells are of forming coherent thoughts. It reaches a point where they can only follow a single command already planned beforehand. That perfectly aligns with the hair pulling idea established by the agencies. The hair is so small that it just can't escape back to the host. It's an insignificant portion of the host. So not only did the show manage to find a way to slightly nerf Parasite power, it also didn't feel like an ass pull because Mickey established this beforehand. Parasite has a firm grasp on controlling its scope and never going too far. It's science fiction so it wouldn't be hard for the mangaka to stretch the rules or make things up, but there's a lot of discipline here and the show is very purposeful on what it chooses to tell us about its world. It's a 24 episode show, so it can only say so much. We're told the Parasite problem is a worldwide phenomenon, but we're never given a perspective outside of the small area of Japan where Shinichi resides. 
We are not given anything resembling a worldwide effort to stop parasites, or anything telling us how it's being handled in any other place. It can be very tempting to try and branch out and address this pandemic on a global scale, but the author is smarter than that and makes sure to keep it at its base. The most insight we ever truly get into other nations and the parasites is when a government agent speculates the Americans are using parasites as weapons, which honestly makes sense. Or you could go back to the rules and general planning of the show that I laid out before. This show knows its limits and never loses sight of its narrative goals. I also appreciate the decision to include another human parasite hybrid. It was necessary for the plot to have Ja or Uda exist, but they do. I really like them because they help this anime feel a bit more real and fleshed out. Sure, Shinichi and Migi are a rare duo, but I think having another human parasite combo who went through the same sort of transformation is pretty cool. It stops Shinichi from getting this weird aura of being special or the chosen one. He's not special. He's just lucky the parasite didn't take his brain, and so is Uda. This creates a couple funny conversations between John and Miggy since they are both in the same predicament, and Shinichi also gets a new ally and such acquaintance to console with. Shinichi Izumi is simultaneously one of the simplest, yet most intriguing characters you will find in Parasite. Writing about Shinichi has undoubtedly been my biggest challenge in the process of making this video, leading me to deal with a major writer's block. Even as I type this out now, I don't know if I truly did Shinichi justice, but I can at least try. For Shinichi's section, I'm going to talk about his relationship with his mother and his transformation. Shinichi Izumi's relationship with his mother is really important to me. The lead up to the death and the subsequent results cause a massive shift in Shinichi's mental and overall status as a character. In the beginning of the show, we're given little glimpses into his life and shown that he has a rather endearing set of parents. They're upstanding and by no means bad people. They're shown to be consistently concerned about his well-being and they are pretty much archetypical good parents. But of course, this gets disrupted after Shinichi's little parasite infection. Suddenly, Shinichi finds himself getting into disagreements and little verbal spats in order to avoid revealing his secret. An example of this can be found in episode 4, where Shinichi yells at his mom for opening the door to his room. She just wanted to tell him that dinner was ready, but Shinichi's paranoia and need to hide Miggy caused him to get more aggressive than needed. He even tells her to knock before she comes in, which isn't an unreasonable request in a vacuum, but he says it in such an irritated and standoffish manner. And then there's another conflict where Nobuko Izumi's motherly intuition causes her to suspect her son is hiding something from her. Of course, any parent active in their child's life can tell when something's wrong, but this unsurprisingly causes Shinichi to hide his secret even more fervently. I try not to be too forthright or aggressive with the inclusion of personal anecdotes, but I can't help it when I view the story of Shinichi and Nobuko Izumi. I love my fucking mother. I'm not exaggerating when I say, the only person who has always been there for me is my mother. Everything she's done, right or wrong, was in service of me, or in the better of, of me as a person. She sacrificed unbelievable things for me. She has starved herself for me. She's gone into debt for me. But what shocks me most is my mom never complained. In fact, she did everything to hide the poverty and struggle from me. My mother never truly explained the extent of our poverty until this year, as I'm in my final years of college. Watching Shinichi's mom have no hesitation in pushing away Shinichi from the burning pot just gives me chills. She literally burned herself, but didn't realize it until seconds later. And it makes me so emotional because I see my own mother in that scene. A mother so obsessed with protecting her child that she literally sacrifices herself, whether that be physically or mentally, and doesn't even realize the pain until later. Shinichi felt an overwhelming guilt for many years, even though it was just his mother being a mother. And you know, maybe my mom was right to hide the poor conditions from me. Maybe she was just trying to make me not feel the same guilt Shinichi felt. Would my mom's life been easier if I wasn't born? Am I a hindrance? Am I a burden to this woman? 
just by the virtue of how much she loves and cares about me? I tell myself that I wish she didn't overwork herself or do so much for me, but if I'm being honest, I don't want the alternative of an average mother or a bad one. Maybe that makes me selfish, or maybe not. But this is why I love Shinichi's relationship with his mother. It resonates with me so deeply. Admittedly, on my initial viewing, the death of Shinichi's mother itself didn't really affect me. It was a scene of the parasite returning to the Shinichi's house in the form of his mother that really emotionally rocked me. Everything in this episode, and the one that came before, led to a flurry of emotions for Shinichi. His concern for the well-being of his parents is unreckonable. This is another situation in which I can't help but feel touched. My own mom is starting to get old. I feel like I'm actively watching her health decline. She's still able to work perfectly fine and do what she needs to get done, but there's something really surreal about the shoe being on the other foot. I'm the one that's in perfect health that is most concerned about the other person now. My mother is the one that needs doctor's appointments. She's the one whose safety concerns me now. I'm the one having to tell her to not go to work when there is a flood happening. Yes, this really happened. I'm the one having to drive her to a doctor's appointment. I'm the one volunteering to cook for our family so she, when she's so tired but too prideful to ask for my help. In essence, I feel what Shinichi does, but only on the smallest scale. I'm a dude in his early 20s who just wants his mom to be okay. Shinichi is a high school teenager faced with the prospect of his mother dying to a poorly understood parasitic agent that eats people alive. I would never even understand 10% of the worry and concern Shinichi felt for his parents during this time frame. And I have to emphasize, Shinichi is a child. He's not even 18 in this scene. I'm 22. He's just a child and he's going through all this shit I just described. Can you imagine what he's feeling when his greatest fear stares him down? When Shinichi finally sees the parasite in front of his eyes? What can he even say in a moment like this? His worst fears have been realized right before his very eyes. The left brain is hauntingly aware of what's in front of him. It's no longer his mother, it's a beast. His caretaker is gone. His mother is nothing but a fragment of his memories. But the right brain doesn't want to accept this result. His mother is right there in front of him. That's his provider, she's, she's right there. The man even tries to communicate and admit the truth about his arm that he's been hiding. He can't accept that she's dead. He just can't. Naboko Izumi is alive, she has to be. Because if she's not alive, that means Shinichi killed her. That means Megi killed her. That means an unknown parasite killed her. Miggy said she'd be okay to go on the trip. Shinichi told her to go, and the parasite murdered her. In the mind of Shinichi Izumi, he has to scramble for denial because if she's dead, he will feel the blame for this. And as if it's not enough that a parasite kills his mother, she only went out on that trip on the advice of another parasite. Shinichi can't help but feel responsible for causing the pain for the ones he loves most. How is he meant to deal with this level of heartbreak? And as if fate wasn't done breaking his heart down metaphorically, we have to get a gruesome scene in which his heart is physically broken down as the enemy parasite pierces through him, leaving him for dead. Hitoshi Awaki decides to play a cruel cool joke on his audience. After years of Noboku living with a scar her son felt guilty for, this parasite takes over her body and inadvertently uses that same burn mark to make Shinichi hesitate. And now, Shinichi must live with his own scar, like his mom had for all those years. Shinichi goes through a transformation unlike any other in the show. Later in the video, I'll be able to easily map out the change in Migi and Reiko Tamura, but Shinichi's case is special. He starts off as a complete prototypical dork who just happens to have Migi attached to him, but then his transformation begins. Shinichi suddenly is making basketball shots while having the worst form on the planet. You can stop a car with his goddamn arm. But despite all that, he's still very much the same. At this stage of his life, you can even call Shinichi virtuous. 
with him even throwing around his son bullshit about wanting to fight for humanity, even though Mickey doesn't really acknowledge such a statement. Shinichi's physical changes are there, but the anime sees fit to slowly introduce us to a more psychological change. This is done through several scenes, one of those being the scene where Tamiya specifically refused to kill Shinichi on the basis that he was no longer pure. There's also moments like where he finds himself cured of his arachnophobia or the strange scene where he engages a group of teenagers and threatens to eat them alive. But there is one thing that's clear with Shinichi despite his changing state. He believes in the superiority of mankind and doesn't think parasites have a right to exist. This is why I find the scene of Shinichi getting his ass beat to be so intriguing. The oh so illustrious question of altruism rears its head. I always found this scene to be vital to the character of Shinichi at this point because it really puts on display what type of mindset he bears. I view him volunteering for this beatdown as hypocrisy in of itself. Shinichi isn't doing this selflessly. He's specifically doing it to prove to himself that he's human after hearing Miggy claim that parasites could never understand the concept of altruism. Humans are different from parasites, Shinichi tells himself. So to prove that, he takes an ass whooping when he doesn't need to. Not simply because he wants to save a guy, but because of his own self-interested reasoning of trying to verify that he's not some animal who only thinks of themselves. Quite ironic. Shinichi's second evolution of his character is even less subtle than the last. Miggy restoring Shinichi's heart has caused Miggy's cells to spread all over Shinichi's body. Shinichi is now significantly close to the parasites on a physical level. Not only can he run faster, he has improved eyesight, he can hear people from significantly further away, and he is way fucking stronger. The one downside to this new evolution of Shinichi is the change to his mental state. He now finds it significantly harder to be emotionally expressive to the point where he can't even cry over his own mother's death. His emotional outlets have been suppressed due to Miggy's cells physically invading his brain. But perhaps what matters most isn't the literal invasion, but the philosophical invasion of Shinichi's brain. When I was originally writing this script, I had a problem of taking things too literally when examining Shinichi. I've come to realize the parasite genes themselves aren't what matters but it's about what they represent. These parasite genes represent Miggy's extremely utilitarian ideology of self-interest, which finds itself in complete opposition to Shinichi's righteous defender of humanity ideology. Some of the best parts of this show were the brief debates between Miggy and Shinichi's ideological clashes. With every new interaction, each side's respective viewpoints begin to morph and change. The most important part of this show is the journey of Shinichi's philosophical development and witnessing Shinichi go from uh, the mindset of a child to that of an adult. He starts off as a moral grandstander. Everything he does at first is to assist and defend his own abstract concept of humanity. This is about as shonen as it gets. He's a child who arbitrarily decides that he himself is the good guy, with his opposition being the bad guys. The ones he needs to kill. But after having his emotional outlets cut off and having multiple people question his humanity, the lines get more and more blurred. Shinichi realizes his preconceived notions and philosophies on humanity's righteousness are breaking down and he cannot handle it. This leads us to a very important scene relating to Shinichi's mental state and it features how he handled the death of Kana. I'm going to get into much more detail on Kana later in this video, but I'm going to keep this Izumi censored for now. When Shinichi is confronted by Mitsuo for letting Kana die, things go completely opposite of how they would have gone before. The previous evolution of Shinichi let Mitsuo kick his ass. Hell, later on when he was perfectly capable of fighting, he didn't even bother. That second fight, he just dodged all the attacks and moved on. But this time around, when Mitsuo chastises Shinichi for not showing any emotion over Kana's death, Shinichi decides to actively hurt Mitsuo and even agrees with Mitsuo's sentiment that he isn't human. The question of Shinichi's humanity is brought to the light once again, with Shinichi screaming, Why do you go down so easily at Mitsuo? I always found this fascinating because it, it's really obvious why a human would go down here. But Shinichi asked that question anyway. I for one have theorized that this question was actually intended for humanity, with Mitsuo serving as a stand-in. The manga chapter for this part of the anime is actually called Red Tear. 
It's a clear allusion to Shinichi slamming his head against a tree to the point of bleeding has his own display of grief because he can't cry for Kana. The blood that drips from his face and are his red tears because actual tears won't drop from his eyes. He explicitly states he wants to mourn Kana's death. This self-harm seems to be the only way he knows how. This leads us to one of the more sadder moments in the show for Shinichi. Another person in his life is dead thanks to an incident he perceives to be his own responsibility. All this, and he can't even do the bare minimum of mourning for them. Simply by shedding a tear. Shinichi has to deal with his ideology surrounding what it means to be human, being tested. He almost feels like he can't handle this test, which is why he hits Mitsuo and slams his head onto this tree. He claims to fight for humanity, but everything in this moment contradicts his fundamental idea of what that even means. He doesn't know how to react, and it's almost as if, instead of fully accepting his binary views or childish, he decides in this moment that he's not human. The third phase of Shinichi's character begins with the death of Tamara. As Shinichi holds Tamara's baby, a sequence of pictures, memories, and flashbacks are on full display. Shinichi's version 2 is gone once the tears start swelling and coming out. At this point, he's overcome the lack of feeling that's haunted him. He can finally shed a tear and express his grief. He's not perfect, he's still very unemotional, but his progress is finally being able to cry, and that's a very satisfying conclusion to this arc of his character. Shinichi begins to fully realize that maybe the question of whether he's human or not was the wrong question to ask. With witnessing Tamara's sacrifice when compared to his own behavior as of late, maybe it's time to consider that there's a lot more nuance to this than his childish beliefs at the beginning of the anime would let on. Him being able to shed a tear in this moment once again takes his beliefs and puts them on a crash course, being tested once again. And we can see the anime effectively using his interaction with villains to push his beliefs to the absolute edge. I'll get more in depth with this later, but we can see in the scene of Hirokawa's delivering a speech on parasites and humanity that Shinichi is actually considering what Hirokawa is saying. He genuinely questions himself and some of his own beliefs. Or, one could consider the first meeting of Uragami. Shinichi nearly shits a brick when he looks at Uragami. He can barely even believe this guy is human. Shinichi is left to wonder if humans are truly any better than parasites when you can meet a guy like Uragami who falls under the same banner of humanity. This all comes to a head when we are presented with the scene of Shinichi standing above the destroyed body of Goto. Shinichi's final evolution as a character takes place right here. Shinichi stares at Goto and cries. He initially doesn't want to kill Goto, despite all Goto's done. Shinichi's come to believe that humans don't have a god-given mandate over the earth and all the life that inhabits it, similar to Hirokawa. He declares that he doesn't feel that he has the right to take the life of even someone as depraved as Goto, and walks off, leaving Goto struggling for life. This is such a far cry from the Shinichi we knew at the beginning of this anime. He's even ready to admit that he wasn't fighting for humanity, but for himself. I think this story has a very unique message on environmentalism that I could never really put into words until this very moment. I originally interpreted this scene purely as Shinichi declaring his duty as a human is protecting the planet. Only upon reflection and advice from my editor did I come to realize that this isn't exactly what the show is even trying to say. I was missing the forest for the trees. As a matter of fact, this show spends its entire runtime rejecting any ideals of duty. As Shinichi walks off, Mei specifically tells him that he despises humans who say they're doing things for the earth. There is no duty. There's no duty to protect humanity. There's no duty to protect the earth. Those childish philosophical views are reserved for those like Hirokawa or an earlier version of Shinichi. And upon hearing Migi say this, Shinichi turns back. As Shinichi stands over Goto's corpse once more, he realizes he has to kill him. 
but he's not deluding himself into thinking he's doing it for any concept of humanity. And he doesn't even think Goto is evil anymore. Shinichi acknowledges that he's just one human trying to protect those he loves. He reluctantly kills Goto out of his own self-interest and makes no claim of doing it for a greater good. He's made the same decision he would have at the start of the series, but we see how much he's matured and changed. Think back to when Shinichi took a beating to prove he was human or some bullshit. As said earlier, his reasoning was selfish, but he was in denial of it. Here, his reasoning is selfish once more, but he's no longer deluded himself into thinking otherwise. His acknowledgement of his self-interest shows his maturity. Whereas before, he would have killed Goto simply on the basis that he's a parasite and parasites are bad, now he's fully considered all options and ultimately has arrived at the most simple conclusion, despite how much wiser he's become. No amount of theorizing about the morality of his actions could change the fact that killing Goto is an act of self-preservation. And that's not a bad thing. Although it's on a smaller scale, Shinichi's decision here parallels the overarching themes of environmentalism. The most important concept in this show is selfish selflessness. There's an episode explicitly named The Selfish Gene, a not so subtle reference to Richard Dawkins, which loosely explains the concept. Seemingly altruistic actions are actually motivated by the self-interest of individuals. For example, someone giving money to the homeless person isn't just doing it for no reason. They're motivated by feeling guilt, or maybe they feel good when they give back to others. Regardless, the point is that the action directly benefits them at the end of the day. It seems like such a simple and obvious concept, but it's one Shinichi was in complete denial of at the start of the series, and one that's often misunderstood in everyday society. Saying that all beings are motivated by self-interest isn't bad. It's not inherently bad to do something selfish, and that's what Parasite is ultimately getting across. Wanting to protect the environment for your own selfish reasons isn't bad. Some wish to do it because they think the planet looks pretty, others do it because they want a secure world for their future children to reside in. Regardless of the reasoning, it's motivated by self-interest and Parasite has no patience for ideologues who choose to ignore this simple fact. A selfish reasoning for altruism benefits all involved, but watering it down and diluting that simple selfish reasoning with ideology and moralizing leads to these goals being corrupted as seen in Hirokawa who I'll get into later. To see Shinichi reach his conclusion to his journey after the tumultuous saga of philosophical metamorphosis is very satisfying. I adore the character of Shinichi Izumi on several levels. His relationship with his mother speaks to me on a very personal note, alongside his well-executed character arc that succeeds in encompassing all major themes of this show. When watching this video, you'll notice the bad guys in this show are the ones who have a major character transformation. It's not a coincidence in my mind. I think the mangaka is trying to communicate to the audience with a message of encouraging growth and evolution of yourself as a person. This show purposely portrays its most evil characters as rigid and unchanging. Shinichi Izumi as the protagonist undergoes the longest and most difficult path towards change, and what results is a satisfying conclusion to a brilliant character. script, the first character that came to mind and that I decided to write about was Tamara. Tamara holds a special place in my heart. I talk about transformations and character arcs a lot during this video, but I don't think there's a character who exemplifies this in the way Tamara does. No matter how many times I watch this show, her character is one I can never get tired of or forget about. She is a key player in my favorite arc of the show and without a doubt my favorite character in the show. Tamara is so striking because she's introduced very early as this alternative to the stereotypical view of a parasite. Up until her introduction, every parasite besides Miggy was shown to be nothing but a bloodthirsty human-eating monster. The anime sort of gives you this crazy idea that it's going to be a show about a teenager with a freaky hand alien that just goes around killing other aliens. But Tamara comes in and immediately disrupts that by introducing a little bit of nuance. Here we have a parasite who's not interested in killing people unless threatened, and she's not even bothering to eat people anymore at this point. 
The scene where her and Mr. A meet Shanice at a dining table portrays her nature very well. Here we have Mr. A spazzing out and barely being able to control himself and the facade of being a human. Meanwhile, Tamara is communicating perfectly and rationally with Shinichi. Look at how Mr. A's face unnaturally contorts while Tamara discusses her pregnancy. It shows the audience that parasites can put differing levels of effort into their attempt to emulate humans. It's very purposeful Mr. A is an exact opposite of Tamara in this scene. And it's not that he's just failing to assimilate, he genuinely doesn't care. Mr. A during this conversation even makes it a point to stand up from the table and tells all the parties involved that the conversation is fucking stupid and he doesn't care about it in the slightest. His only interest is eating humans and staying alive. That's not Tamara's mindset though. Tamara seems interested in learning about the purpose of parasites and why they exist. She seems to want to understand human psychology. Tamara is very intelligent and finds herself significantly more concerned with understanding the world around her than simply feeding on humans and trying to effectively survive. But even though she's given this nuance, at the beginning of her character arc, she is still a fucking ruthless and emotionless parasite. Even in the scene where she specifically describes how she won't eat anyone, you can see the show purposely flash two scenes of her looking decidedly inhuman. Even in the first encounter between her and Shinichi, there's a sudden and off-putting frame placed in the show to convey the pure terror Shinichi feels upon seeing her. So all in all, despite her showing a much more controlled animalism, she holds no qualms of letting the beast go wild when she sees fit. Humanity is something to be studied, not empathized with. Her unrivaled intelligence alongside her inquisitive nature sets her up to be one of the most intriguing parasites in the show. Her pregnancy only complicates things. Tamara only got pregnant because of the aforementioned inquisitive nature. She was trying to study humans, and that was the primary reason she decided she wanted to have a baby. When she mentions her pregnancy and discusses it with others, she repeatedly dehumanizes or minimizes the importance of the child at first. Early on, she even claimed that she's going to eat the fucking baby. She has an interaction with Takeshi Hirokawa where she asks what the purpose of parasite existence is, and more specifically, asks Hirokawa about her pregnancy. Hirokawa pushes his propaganda that parasites are a sort of equalizer and predator for humans, and it's their job to stop said humans from ruining the planet. He specifically tells Tamaro that the fetus going inside her is a toxin. This scene's rather important because you can see Tamaro actually trying to give this some thought. Even at this point in the show, she's not 100% buying her own shit about how the baby is simply an experiment and that's it. She's showing some sort of like reflection upon what she's doing. With all that being said, when she actually gives birth to the child, she isn't exactly the most pleasant mother. She may not completely dismiss the child as an experiment, but I'd say she's a good 90% there. A good illustration of my point is the scene where she simply whispers into the baby's ear, quiet, and the little dude immediately shuts the fuck up, to the absolute horror of the nanny who's watching. She's good enough to do the basic things with childcare despite being an emotionless parasite, but she clearly lacks the whole loving thing. But I see this all as part of the gradual transformation of Tamara. Another important example of her slow development has to be when she laughs at the detective falling over in the diner. Tamara not too long ago probably would have just walked away and not gave a shit, but here she's laughing at someone in pain. She's feeling something. It's a bit easy to overlook this at first and dismiss it as evil parasite laughs at pain, but the reality is, a parasite shouldn't have the capacity to even find things like this funny. Laughing at someone's misfortune is a inherently human thing, is it not? And specifically, she didn't realize she was laughing or that her face was fucked up that entire time. That means she wasn't just doing it for show, she genuinely felt that. Her growing individuality and transformation becomes problematic for the group of parasites she's associated with. In a meeting between parasites, she specifically pressed for her comments that were implying, or even just outright declaring, that parasites can't defeat humanity. Her baby is immediately assumed to be part of what might be influencing her beliefs, and the response we get from Tamara upon hearing this accusation is very telling. Instead of vehemently denying it, or taking any real action to prove her loyalty to the group, she casually declares that she can't kill the baby yet. It's very revealing because the previous version of Tamara would have probably just agreed to kill that baby on the spot to keep unity within the group. But no, she decides that that's not what she wants. She's thinking about herself and what she wants. After this tense exchange, Tamara later finds herself surrounded by three parasites from the group. 
They all believe her execution is necessary as she's become a danger to the group. This is one of my favorite fights in the show for a number of different reasons. Firstly, the fact parasites are fighting each other like this is such a contrast from what we know about these beings. In fact, Tamara comments on this herself. She's actually happy they decided to kill her because it's shown they formed some individuality and difference in opinion. Tamara is great because it feels like the further her arc goes on, the more the show overall is forced to confront the proximity of parasites to humans. Her comment on being happy that the parasites decided to fight her shows that she's at a point where she's acutely aware of her own transformation and change of self. It isn't like when she was laughing and making insane faces when she had no idea about it. She's become much more cognizant of this process. After killing her attackers, the narrative continues to escalate the transformation of Tamara by having her baby kidnapped by private investigator Kuramori. Upon discovering that her baby is missing, Tamara seems genuinely angry. There's a distinct look in her eyes upon the realization of the missing child. On the baby's crib, Tamara sees a note by the private investigator telling her to meet at the park tomorrow. Of course, Tamara can't take this line down and begins to concoct a plan to retrieve her baby, and this plan involves Shinichi. After deciding to rescue her child, we get a scene of Tamara inside Shinichi's house. After calling Shinichi, we are specifically shown her looking through his family computer and seeing pictures of baby Shinichi and baby Shinichi's mom. This is juxtaposed with Tamara having flashbacks of her killing Ryoko Tamiya's mother. Tamara, in this moment, doesn't show much emotion and only utters the words, a mother, while she blankly stares into the monitor. This is interrupted by Murano ringing the Izumi household's doorbell. Tamara walks outside and has a brief discussion with Murano, where I witness the most revealing set of words to ever leave Tamara's mouth. Upon listening to Murano express her concern with Shinichi's whereabouts and well-being, Tamara responds that she's envious. She says, I see that you're worried, I'm envious. And if we want to go by the English dub, she even says in the English dub that she's jealous. I find this very interesting. I don't know why, but this is one of the most challenging things to dissect when rewatching the show. What exactly is Tamara envious of? It isn't as simple as you may think. Is Tamara envious of Shinichi's humanity and having someone like Murano who worries about him? I mean, she's a parasite. In her mind, that means no one could ever give her that concern. Or is she jealous of the fact that Murano can feel that level of concern and worry about someone else? Which might not be something a parasite can truly feel? With the scene of her on Shinichi's computer coming to mind alongside the memory of Tamiya's dead mother, was Tamara declaring that she wanted to have the capacity of love and concern for another being? Maybe Tamara was jealous in both those ways. But her words, I'm envious, do mean one thing no matter how one slices it. It is an admission by Tamara that she wants something humanity has. And this is a long way from her beginning as a parasite. I can't preach to you any harder how much I love this scene, and this specific line. Skipping ahead to Tamaro's confrontation with Kuramori, we arrive at what I'd argue is the climax of her story. Kuramori is infuriated after the death of his own family members, absolutely devastated. He has the nutcase idea of kidnapping Tamaro's baby to make her feel the same pain that he does. His plan is pretty insane in the fact that he has no idea how much Tamara may or may not value that child. If his original assessment of her as nothing but a monster is true, what motivation does she come to help come retrieve this baby? And on the other hand, if she really is just a monster using a baby as an experiment, wouldn't this just make her more ruthless with how she treats him considering he stole the experiment? Kuramori rants to her about how she could never feel the pain he's felt losing his family. But it's the moment when he threatens to kill the baby that does it all. Tamara has a flash of emotion in her eyes. The subtle red particles that show up when a parasite is about to engage someone, that shows up here. Miggy comments on Tamara giving off a signal he's never felt before. She immediately stabs the private investigator and recovers her baby. Tamara, the woman who once threatened to eat this child, has now killed someone for threatening to even hurt the baby. 
she and Kuramori are both surprised by her actions. For as self-aware as Tamara has been the majority of the show, even this moment, she's caught herself off guard of her own actions. She wasn't calculated this moment, she was purely emotional. This is not how a parasite operates. Tamara has one last discussion with Shinichi and Migi. Her final conclusion is that parasites and humans are two halves of the same whole. She calls humans and parasites one single family. She even goes as far as saying parasites are fragile, imploring Shinichi to not bully them. After giving birth to this child and growing to have maternal feelings for it, Tamara has had an unbelievable change of her heart. I think it's very telling that parasites breed human children. Humans and animals are driven by their need to reproduce. Humans in particular make investments into their offspring for a myriad of reasons, many of those reasons being selfish. Not everyone raises their child with equal effort, and not everyone even raises their child of their own volition with the pressures of society and legal systems looming over them. That's what makes Tamara's love for her child even more special to me. She doesn't have to care. This child isn't going to propagate the existence of parasites. She doesn't even have to conform to the rules of child neglect or any societal pressure. She can change her face whenever she wants and escape any situation. Her maternal feelings are of a very selfless and genuinely loving nature. Maybe it's a step too far to suggest the parasite loving another being. But at one point it was a step too far to even suggest they could feel emotion. Maybe they don't experience it the same way humans do, but I don't know if that invalidates such a thing. After this discussion with Shinichi, Tamara does one more thing that I think truly speaks to her evolution as a character. Yes, even after saving her child and multiple times now dropping lines admitting to her newfound feelings, she still has one final display of her own humanity. When the police confront her and Shinichi and begin shooting Tamara non-stop, she uses her hair to defend the baby and does not attempt to fight back. It's such an emotional onslaught for the viewer, because once again, this is an infant she had zero love or empathy for. It was her experiment, she threatened to eat it alive, and here she is, sacrificing herself in complete contradiction to what Reiko Tamiya would have ever done. But what matters most to me in this scene wasn't just the act of defending the baby, it was Tamara's decision to change her face to that of Shinichi's mom. She does this to make Shinichi lower his guard and not attack her before she can deliver the baby to him. This isn't just some cheap trick. Tamara's newfound understanding of the importance of a mother is the only reason she could ever conceive of this working. She understands that the only thing that will make Shinichi lower his guard is the image of the woman who cared for him most. It's ironic because Tamara is doing this while actively sacrificing herself for her own child. Tamara hands the baby off and peacefully dies knowing she did her duty as a mother. Both now being maternal orphans, Shinichi and the baby shed tears. Reiko Tamara's death is perfect. She died in such a narratively conclusive and satisfying fashion. Her death marks a change in not just her, but Shinichi as Migi as well. It genuinely brings tears to the eyes. If you ever wake up with a random parasitic growth on your arm that has the ability to talk, just hope you have a Miggy. Miggy might be my runner up for favorite character in the show. He has a ton of comedic moments, contributes to moving the plot forward in a lot of ways, and has an almost equally satisfying end to his character arc to that of Tamara. Miggy's journey throughout his story is centered around his inability to feel empathy and his inability to grasp altruism. His character makes it very clear on multiple occasions that he is entirely self-interested and having no moral quandaries with murder or any action that helps facilitate his survival. I mean, I can pull any number of examples of this from Miggy's dialogue. 
he just explicitly states that he only values his own life in episode 2. In that same episode where a parasite offers Miggy an alternate route where he does not need Shinichi anymore, he kills the parasite because he doesn't trust the parasite, not because he wants to help Shinichi. And believe it or not, this is one of the lighter moments of Miggy, one of the least cruel things he has said or done. Miggy's ruthless mindset extends to all manners of situation. When Mr. A invades the school, Miggy suggests the outlandish idea of using dozens of students as cover so Mr. A can be eliminated much easier. Shinichi promptly rejects this idea and has to go with his own extremely different idea. This is another example of him making it clear he doesn't care about the survival of anyone but himself. Even when Miggy revives Shinichi, he makes sure to not take any credit for it. He promptly tells Shinichi that his life is connected to Shinichi's, so by virtue of him depending on Shinichi, he had no other choice but to save Shinichi's life. And at this point in the story, I have no reason to doubt he actually meant this. Miggy has been nothing but ruthless and self-interested. Anything that he's done in the benefit of Shinichi was for the sake of satiating his host rather than because he actually cared about Shinichi. Perhaps the final nail in the coffin for me is in episode 10 where Miggy once again declares that he has no interest in stopping parasites or helping humanity. Scoffing at Shinichi's idealism and attempted heroics, all while reading a book called Crime and Punishment. But Miggy does something interesting here that I think marks a key point in his transformation. When he declares his stance of not giving a shit, this time he slightly alters his rhetoric. He specifically asks Shinichi to step in his shoes and asks Shinichi how comfortable Shinichi would feel if he was being asked to commit genocide of his own kind. And to further prove my point, look back on the scene where Miggy and Jaw are threatening the private investigator's life. Now, in between this conversation and the one in Shinichi's bedroom, Miggy has had at least two other times where he's shown he does not care if humans die, and in one declared that his kind will never feel any sympathy. But in this scene with the PI, we see Miggy once again utilize the same rhetoric he used against Shinichi. At first, he starts off with this all too common spiel about self interest and his own rights as a living being. But then he switches things up and asks Kuromori to put himself in Shinichi's shoes and try to understand all the shit Shinichi has been through. Shinichi's mom is dead. He's undergone a life altering change to his body. He feels in danger at all times. And he's watching some of his closest relationships fall apart. Shinichi himself is actually caught off guard by this completely, even outright stating that these are things Miggy would never say. Miggy is at the point in this character where he doesn't really feel for others, but he can at the very least use these fickle emotions to manipulate humans. It's a faint understanding, but an understanding nonetheless. But it's within the final moments of Reiko Tamara where we see this change in Miggy get much more intense, despite being subtly displayed up until now. In Tamara's final moments where she's defending her baby and trying to deliver this child to Shinichi, Miggy is automatically assuming she intends to strike them down. He repeatedly warns Shinichi and freaks out as Tamara walks closer and closer. And then once the baby is delivered and Tamara chooses to voluntarily die after giving her life to the child, Miggy is left in a state of absolute confusion. His mind sporadic, Miggy is left wondering why she did not attack back or defend herself in the slightest. Tamara was one of the most capable parasites he had ever seen, and here was one of the strongest living beings of his kind, stooping low to altruistic acts such as rescuing a human baby. And for what is probably one of the first times in this show, Miggy is absolutely dumbfounded. He cannot find words for what the fuck just happened. He is in shock. In a later scene a bit after the events in question, we get a scene of the confused individuals of Miggy and Shinichi discussing their most recent encounters. Shinichi declares that he cannot understand how Urugami can even be human. Meanwhile, a man-eating monster like Tamara is out here saving a child. Miggy has a bit of a mask off moment here where he outright admits he can't understand this behavior. This scene strikes me because Miggy gets animated in such a way that conveys sadness. Even his voice feels downtrodden. Miggy is bothered by the fact that he can't fully comprehend Tamara's behavior. He just doesn't understand how someone of his kind could do this. Miggy isn't questioning Tamara, he's questioning himself. All this buildup is what makes Miggy's final moments that much more tear-wrenching, but ultimately satisfying. 
After he and Shinichi fail to kill Goto, Miki volunteers his own life to distract Goto and outright tells Shinichi to run away. He makes it clear that they don't have to both die. Miki, who specifically said he would never understand altruism, is sacrificing his own life. And as Miki fades away, the veneer comes right off. Miki expresses gratitude he got an opportunity to be friends with Shinichi. He's happy he didn't take over Shinichi's brain. After witnessing Tamara's final moments and watching his kind develop similarities to humanity, Miggy finally lets these feelings he's built up spill through. Miggy truly was a self-centered being most of his existence, so to see this complete 180 in perspective is beautiful. And I don't want this sacrifice to be understated. One could present a flimsy argument that Miggy was bound to die regardless, and they'd be correct, but that just ignores that Miggy most certainly could have laid down and accepted his death without trying to urge Shinichi to live. He could have asked Shinichi to help out and maybe increase his odds of winning by like 1%. But he didn't. All those sentimental thoughts he expressed afterwards also show that he really was interested in sacrificing himself for his friend. Miggy didn't gain anything by telling Shinichi to run away. That was completely what he said out of his own love for Shinichi. And I believe this all coalesces together when Miggy has a final discussion with Shinichi whilst they both stare at the rotting corpse of Goto. Miggy actually declines to kill Goto and leaves the decision up to Shinichi. After an entire series of Miggy gladly filling his role in as a beast, he declines to commit what humans would call murder. After seeing the evolved frame of mind with Tamara, developing an ability to understand others, and witnessing the suffering inflicted by Goto's parasitic and monstrous nature, he decides to not give in to that same bloodlust. To call the evolution of Miggy endearing would be to undersell what is accomplished with this character. He started off strong and ended just as strong, leaving his mark on this show and exiting once his arc was over. Miggy is adorable and I love him dearly. I am very happy to have gotten another chance to watch this anime and spend time with this character. ちょっと勃起させてみてくれ。なんだって。ちょ、何するんだ。よせ。やめろってのは。脅かすな、新一。なんだ。人間の交尾が見られるかと思ったのに。<笑><笑> ねてろ。This video has been pretty heavy so far. So let's take a little break. I have three more characters I really want to discuss, but I want to have a short discussion on one specific character before I get back into this. So let's lighten the mood up and have a little discussion on Kana. I have a lot of great things to say about Parasite. Kana is, unfortunately, not one of them. So to the surprisingly large number of Kana fans out there, sorry to burst your bubble. Kana Kimishima is a girl who has a rare ability to sense parasite signals. She's a pretty relaxed person with a slight mean girl streak to her, often taking pleasure watching people get bullied. One of those victims happens to be Shinichi, who she soon falls head over heels for. Now you may be asking, why does she fall in love with Shinichi? And to that I respond... Kana stands out to me as the red-headed stepchild amongst the major characters found in this show. There's no easy way to say this, especially considering how much I love this show, but 
Arcana is just retarded. Okay, I'm lying. <laughs> that was really easy to say and I don't have any reservations in making fun of this character. Like, she's not a stupid person or anything, she's just written to be a dumbass for the convenience of the plot. When I analyze Kana, it feels as if she was explicitly written to be killed no matter what and the author got kind of sloppy with how he arrived at this death. First off, Kana just develops a crush on Shinichi. It just happens. I am not a fan of this in the slightest. It doesn't really feel natural and just comes across as creepy. I don't think you understand how hard it is for a girl in an anime to come across as the creep in a romantic courtship. That's genuinely impressive. I mean, I understand the idea of writing a character with a love interest who's never going to acquit said love, but I don't find it believable of Kana. It's just so forced. This weird forced love thing was done on purpose so that Kana will have an excuse to repeatedly follow Shinichi around since she can sense his signal. It honestly gets embarrassing when this woman begins to declare she can sense Shinichi because they're soulmates or whatever Telemundo soap opera bullshit she tells herself. We also get two dream sequences of Kana hardcore thirsting over Shinichi. I get that it's meant to make the love thing more believable, but it's just really fucking funny. <laughs> she also specifically keeps a single hair of Shinichi's and protects that shit like it's a fucking diamond. You see, I don't doubt Kana is in love with Shinichi. I just don't care for how she magically reached this point. Anyway, even after Shinichi eventually explains to her that she should not be following him and that this shit could get dangerous real quick, she doesn't fucking listen. She even has the audacity to claim that she can tell the difference between the other parasites and Shinichi. No the fuck you can't, you dumbass. And then we reach the episode where she finally fucking dies. And at this point, I can't tell if she's under some extreme teenager hormone love delusion nonsense, or if the writers are just determined to make her look as retarded as needed for plot reasons. Shinichi says he wants to change the meeting place and tells Kana specifically to not go near the trains. Kana then decides to leave her house because she thinks she senses him. This is despite an incident not too long ago where she thought she sensed him and freaked the fuck out when she realized it wasn't him, it was a parasite. Not only does she go running off to this random fucking signal, she leaves her phone on the table. Out of all the writing decisions in this anime, this one dumbfounded me the most. This one has to be the worst. I know Parasite was originally written in the late 80s, so smartphones did not exist. So what I'm about to complain about may very well be an anime exclusive issue, but it makes no fucking sense for her to leave her phone on this table. Even if she thinks she sent to Shinichi, why didn't she bring her phone anyway so she can talk to him on the phone while she's looking for him? Shinichi literally said he would call her again. Why didn't she bring her fucking phone? I can't stand this kind of storyline because it feels like we're going to kill her and it doesn't matter how we arrive at this conclusion. It's pretty sad no matter how many times I witness Kana getting stabbed, all I can really think is, wow, you're dumb as fuck. I'm supposed to feel sympathetic about this, but I feel angry every time I watch this shit. And it's not an anger at the fact that she gets killed, it's an anger at the fact that she lets herself get killed in the most stupid way possible. It's kind of a failure on your part if the character you want me to sympathize with, I just am angry at them for dying and getting stabbed. You made me angry at the victim. Consider that. I understand Kana's place in the plot. I do. She's meant to be the sacrificial lamb for Shinichi's character development. She's meant to cause a little rift between Moruno and Shinichi, you know, a little love triangle tension. She's meant to die so that Shinichi has another person to feel upset over. But that's the issue. She ultimately feels like a tool rather than an actual character we should sympathize or feel bad for. I feel that the mangaka could have exponentially improved her by fixing the romantic element of her character or doing any number of things. Just make her feel not forced. Whether that means giving her more screen time or waiting longer to kill her, something needed to be done. 
Kana is easily the worst part of this show. I don't know why people like her, but it really isn't my fucking job to parse through that. At the end of the day, if you write a story and your worst story is someone like Kana, I'll take that as a compliment and keep pushing. I originally was considering not mentioning Hirokawa. He's important to the show, but not to the level where he feels necessary to mention. However, I decided to include him because I realized he falls perfectly into an archetype I've seen put forth with all antagonists within the show. Every antagonist in Parasite follows a trend of not changing in complete opposition with the heroes of the story who all end up undergoing some sort of major transformation. Hirokawa has the same mentality from beginning to end. He is an environmentalist who values the sanctity of the earth. He's taken his beliefs to their most extreme yet logical conclusion. He believes the culling of the human population is the only way to save the earth. So when Hirokawa finds out about the existence of parasites, he actually sets out to form a cabal of a multitude of parasites in an attempt to gather political power and support for the parasites. One of the major goals of this group is to set up safe houses for the parasites to feed on humans. Hirokawa's alliance with the parasites is based entirely in his environmentalist streak that leads him to view the humanity as trash. He believes the parasites must be kept alive and used as some sort of check to humanity. If these parasites can effectively reduce humanity's numbers, it would help the earth in the long run. In the Shinichi section, I mentioned how childish Shinichi's ideology was at the inception of the show. What makes Hirokawa interesting is that he's identical to early Shinichi in how he approaches his ideology. Shinichi idolizes humanity believing all parasites should die. Meanwhile, Hirokawa idolizes parasites believing all humans should die. But there is a difference. From beginning to end, Hirokawa is staunch in his viewpoint and isn't moved by anything. He doesn't care what new information he receives about parasites, nor does he really truly consider an alternative except the murder of humans to achieve his goals. In our first introduction to him, he specifically tells Tamara that the baby growing inside her was a poison. And in his last appearance in episode 21, we get one of the most famous moments of the show where Hirokawa delivers a full-scale condemnation of humanity. Parasite is no stranger to being upfront with its questions and spelling out its message to the viewer, and this speech is no exception to that trend. Hirokawa's speech reminds me of that of a whining teenager. For all the genuine insights he may give, and all the expression he does give us of his beliefs, it's much harder to take him or his proselytizing seriously. He has not changed his view, nor given any other route a thought. He's a stubborn man who refuses to accept the challenge to his ideology. It's quite ironic. His speech served as a reaffirmation of everything he believed in, and he went on to die a painful death. Meanwhile. Hirokawa's speech challenged Shinichi philosophically, with Shinichi going on to survive. Throughout the runtime of the show, parasites are given a very distinct, dead look within their eyes. You can tell who is and isn't a parasite usually just by looking at that region of their face. However, this gets upended when we are introduced to a character named Mickey. We'll discuss Goto in a bit, but Mickey is a really important discussion, despite his brief appearance. Mickey is a parasite who seems to have actually picked up an interest in facial expressions. Unlike the other parasites, he's significantly more expressive, to the point where even Shinichi is fooled into thinking Mickey is a human. Shinichi, up until this point, may have not been able to detect a parasite, but the fact he had to second guess himself when viewing Mickey is really a big challenge to Shinichi's narrative of the parasites being so different from humans. The lines between parasite and humans were already blurred, but this just added on. But what really matters is the other being residing within Miki's body, the head honcho, Goto. 
people have a lot to say about the last act of the show, specifically with Goto and Urugami. But I will outright tell you, Goto being the final parasite you confront is the most narratively intelligent and sensible choice. Goto is the realization of every single fear of parasites wrapped into one being. One could argue he is the most parasitic parasite of them all. He calls himself explicitly a wild organism. The man embraces animalistic persona and only cares about survival. He isn't concerned with humanity or even really the parasites. In fact, the only part of him that ever tried to mimic humanity was Mickey. And it isn't just a question of his mentality, it's also how he fucking looks too. Look at his chosen form when fighting Shinichi. This is grotesque even by this show's standards. Look at the numerous eyes, sharp animal teeth, the tentacles, or the fact this motherfucker spouts deer feet. Goto isn't a parasite, he's a caricature of what Shinichi and Himani have thought parasites were this entire time. He's the actual nightmare they feared, an actual monster. In fact, if you want to add another layer to him, why not take into account that he's only this much of a freak due to Tama creating him through experimentation. Even among the parasites, you could consider Goto to be an abomination. So how ironic is it that Shinichi's final fight with a parasite is everything he feared about parasites? Goto may not be your favorite. You may find his motivation boring. But let's think about it. How different are his motivations from anyone else or even that of Shinichi's? He and Shinichi are just two organisms that are both determined to survive. And if you want to get objective, Shinichi has arguably been more of a monster than Goto at certain points. Yes, Goto is attempting to kill our protagonist out of a feeling of revenge. But I do wonder if one who wishes to condemn Goto could be equally critical of Shinichi. Goto wanted revenge against one man who he felt had slighted him. But Shinichi, after witnessing the death of his mother, he immediately stated that he wanted to genocide the parasites for his own revenge. He wanted to kill all of them before any other murders even happened. Truth be told, I don't think I can tell you was worse in the grand scheme of things. And I'm sure many people will take issue with the comparison I made by claiming it was reductionist and simplistic. If you argue that, I won't completely disagree. But I will say this. I don't think Goto was given enough credit for the role he plays in the story's last act. I don't think anyone else was more fitted to wrap things up here. Shinichi's journey and the constant challenges to his philosophies and beliefs, Goto being the final parasite is a test of Shinichi's character and conviction. And as described earlier in this video, Shinichi stands up to this challenge. He accepts his selfishness. Goto never changes from beginning to end. Even as his corpse is rotting, his cells are trying to recover. Because from the start, all that matters to Goto really is surviving. When I was speaking on Goto, you may have noticed I kept specifically saying he was the best choice for a final parasite in the show. That's because I wanted to give credit to Uragami, who I considered the best villain to end the show and possibly the best villain in the show, period. I know a lot of people do not like Uragami or the last episode of Parasite, but let me sell you on this shit real quick. We discuss the relevance of eyes very often when we look at this anime. It's the way we differentiate humans from parasites, right? And that's why it's very telling that Urogami is a human, but has the most monstrous and unsettling looking eyes in the series. The author is purposely heightening the sheer level of evil that emanates from this man. Shinichi is extremely calm and collected in most scenarios and can't even detect the parasite's signal, but when placed in front of Urogami, it is the most rattled you will see Shinichi. 
Shinichi is genuinely disturbed by looking into this man's eyes. This human is worse than a fucking parasite. How could you even argue that someone like Migi or Tamara had less of a right to exist than Uragami? This show constantly asks about the differences between parasites and humanity and puts a lot of moral dilemmas on the plate for its protagonist and audience to deal with. Throwing Uragami in the mix only muddies the waters even more. You see, parasites eat people because that's their directive. It's what they're born to do, not something they were taught. An infant child's rooting instinct isn't taught either. But somehow, a child fresh out the womb turns its head immediately and does a sucking motion with their mouth the minute you touch their cheek with a nipple or finger. So when you consider Uragami's murders, they're all the more worse. He isn't doing it because of a biological drive telling him to do it. He isn't doing it because he has a cause or belief system or something he truly stands for. His reasoning for taking a life isn't even half as reasonable as that of the parasites. They do it for food or to defend themselves so they don't get discovered by humanity. Urugami isn't the same. I'd argue he's the most evil person in the show. The most evil entity in the show is by far the best one to end this show with. Just because he's not as imposing as Goto doesn't mean he's lackluster. Here's something you may have not realized even on repeated watches. Urugami's first appearance in the show is actually in episode 1. If you can remember, there's a scene during Urugami's introduction that shows a flashback of him killing a woman. If you go back to the very first episode in the series, that flashback was in it. The first episode of the show ended off with a woman being killed, but it wasn't a parasite, it was a human. It was Uragami. From the very start, this show was trying to tell you that humans can be fucking monsters too, not just parasites. And now, here we are in the last episode of the show, and Uragami has shown his mug once again. The darkest depths of human depravity stands right before our protagonist once again. You would think the final fight would be against a parasite, but no, it's against a human. Uragami drones on about his murderous behavior and how it's true human nature. And you know, this isn't the first time we've heard this in the show. Miggy himself in the early episodes of this show declared that the closest thing to a demon was actually a human being. Hirokawa in his environmentalist ramblings declared that the true parasite to Earth was humanity itself. In fact, Uragami presents a similar argument for the murder of human beings like Hirokawa but under his own disingenuous overpopulation argument. But this is all a farce. We know Uragami is principled. He's full of shit. And just like his buddy Hirokawa, he's not considered an alternative route. He is philosophically a child. That's what makes the overpopulation argument so funny. It shows that he is so deep in his own philosophy and beliefs, refusing to change, that he's willing to tell himself this delusion that he genuinely does not believe in. He can't be challenged on his views, that's not possible. He needs there to be an overpopulation problem because that's his excuse to kill people. He's doing humanity a service. And as if lying to himself about the overpopulation thing wasn't enough, he also decides to cope and say that everyone else is just like him, but they're just better at hiding their true nature. Uragami is a perfect way to end the show. Sure, he may not be as exciting, but he is the ultimate final boss which needs you to overcome. Uragami is a direct challenge to the idea that humanity inherently deserves more than any other animal or organism. It's only fitting that after the dust settles and parasites have been immensely reduced in numbers, we'd be confronted with the true enemy of humanity rearing its ugly head. Humanity. And to conclude, there's one more thing I want to say about Uragami that has applied to both Goto and Hirokawa that I will restate again. It feels as if the author of this show is really preaching against this one thing, stagnation. Everyone who we see get portrayed in a positive light had a transformation of their being. Shinichi, Migi, Tamara, they all come to mind. But the three most evil entities in the show all had flat character arcs where they stayed who they were from beginning to start. Uragami, Goto, and Hirokawa. This show was rather ambiguous at first of its message, but by the end, 
they make it clear what their stance on this particular cast of villains is. Parasite or human is a shallow distinction. What matters more so than anything is your ability to develop as a being. Maybe even show compassion for the other living things around you. The person who can grow past their animalistic tendencies of trying to dominate everything around them, maybe they're the ones who should inherit the earth? I don't fucking know, I'm not no philosopher, I'm a YouTuber, man. Animation. This can be a touchy subject. I do want to preface this by saying this is TV anime, so I might be a little harsh, but it is what it is. <laughs> There's a lot of misunderstandings in what constitutes good and bad animation. Much of this discourse sadly boils down to people having a bad habit of just taking screenshots of in-betweens in an attempt to discredit some legitimately good work, but I'm not going to focus on that. Instead. The one point of criticism I will 100% love at Parasite is its use of CG. Holy fuck. If you aren't paying attention, it's not really noticeable, but if you have watched this anime as many times as I have, all the rampant CG humans becomes fucking glaring. I understand the reasoning. CG is used because it saves a lot of time and money so you do not have to draw more people. I get it. I can forgive the occasional use of it, and in the case of vehicles, it's not really that off-putting. But one aspect of CG that has never looked good is CG crowds, and that seems to be what Parasite is most fond of. If you can find any example of CG crowds looking good in an anime, I'll personally give you a blowy. Parasite on repeated watches can be at times really annoying and suffer from immersion break when you look at the PS2 models they have standing in random scenes where characters belong. It would be somewhat bearable if it was just used for large crowds only, but I see two students walking together being CGI, forgive me for being bothered by this IROT. It is used a lot, and not just in particularly desperate situations for animation. I will give credit where credit is due. They usually do a good job of not letting these scenes with CG stay on screen too long, but I got very keen to it and even wrote down over a dozen notes about the specific point. I don't wish to beleaguer the point any further because the reality is simple. Anime is hard to make, and many East Asian countries already have toxic work cultures that encourage working yourself to death in exchange for terrible pay. That much is clear. So if they throw in a couple extra PS1 Lara Croft models in the background, so be it. I, I can't lie to you though. This shit is real ugly dog. like it's really fucking annoying bro. Aside from that, this show has a lot of quality animation and great moments I genuinely enjoyed watching. It would be easy to create my powers from like Reiko Tamara's fight versus the other parasites or any of the numerous fights featuring Shinichi and an enemy parasite. The show has well choreographed and entertaining fights backed up by tons of good animation. But for me, some of my favorite moments aren't watching parasite blades crashing into each other. For me, it's the little things. Miggy is a great example in this regard. Like, look at this scene where Miggy is excited and non-stop talking about things that interest him. While he does this, he just repeatedly morphs his little alien body. Just look at this shit and tell me it's not adorable. I don't mean to dismiss the source material, especially since I haven't actually read it, but I just doubt you could convey this much personality in the pages of the manga. This is why animation is special, because you get little moments like this. I also appreciate the little details that I didn't notice my first time watching. For example, Tamara's eyes. There's a red blood or like red dots in her eyes when she's about to get into a fight or engagement. To put this on an eye shot that we will only see for a split second is an attention to detail I have to admire. And in fact, 
It was only through me seeing this on Tamara that I began to realize this strange red bud texture that shows up on eyes, it shows up a lot more frequently than I thought in this show. And not just on eyes, sometimes on parasite bodies. One more scene I'd love to give credit to is the final dream sequence of Shinichi and Migi. Watching Migi say goodbye is pretty heart-wrenching on its own, but this scene is even more emotional when it reaches the point images of people in Shinichi's life begin to show up in his brain. Look at these beautifully drawn images of his mother, Kana, and several other people who he met along the journey. An image of Migi is even formed, and that small little adorable Migi walks over to Kana, who plays with his eye a little bit. This is without a doubt one of the most emotionally salient scenes you will see in this anime, and the art direction and subtle animation does so much for it. Kunihiko Sakurai's direction for this final episode pleased me very fucking much. Parasite is a show that looks good where it matters. I don't think it's something groundbreaking in terms of animation or art, but it's pretty good. This iteration of Madhouse focused most of the quality where it mattered and the worst complaints I can really levy against it is some ugly CG. And if I'm being honest, this isn't really a big deal because it's not something you'll notice, so I'm not going to let that take away from all the good I see. Parasite soundtrack is one thing above all else, unique. It does get its praise, but it isn't without criticism from the audience, and that includes me. Firstly, I do want to give credit for the risks I see being taken with this soundtrack. In my opinion, it's pretty daring to go with this sort of sound. Actually, I don't even know how to define what this OST sound really is, because it goes in so many directions. One minute I'm hearing electronic music, then it's trap beats, the next it's dubstep, and then it's sad piano ballads? But if there is one divisive factor with the OST, it's its dubstep music. If I'm to be quite frank, the dubstep music fucking annoys me, but I also enjoy it. In the context of the show, it served its purpose, but listening to it outside of that context is a task I am just not up for, and these tracks are prone to overstaying their welcome. Truth be told, I might be hating on these tracks because they're dubstep and that sound sort of bores me, but I still think it has a place in this anime. If there was an anime that was going to so frequently use this type of music, it'd be fucking Parasite. In fact, the overall soundtrack can be pretty weird, but that's what makes it cool. It's like Ken Arai was told to make music for some niche space themed JRPG and he just hits it out the park.
Despite the weirdness though, the soundtrack knows how to reel itself in and execute elegantly in times of heightened emotion. Overall, I'd say the soundtrack to this anime is very well executed. I don't want to go as far as some people who call it the best anime OST they've ever heard, but I do want to say it's good and it's certainly a cut above average. I thoroughly enjoyed the soundtrack and what it did for my overall experience. I feel as if fans of anime have a really bad habit of putting aesthetics over substance. During the research for this video, I searched anime similar to Parasite. I was legitimately surprised to see Tokyo Ghoul being mentioned multiple times and even being cited as a good alternative. I am here to unequivocally tell you that Tokyo Ghoul is gutter trash and should not even be in the same conversation or sentence as Parasite. But when I saw those results, it made me question this show's popularity. It made me question this show's reverence amongst audiences. It's very clear to me that Tokyo Ghoul's popularity was mostly a result of people liking the art and cool aesthetics surrounding it. The edginess and gore made for something that a lot of preteens were in love with. So when I see a show like that put alongside Parasite, was Parasite even being appreciated for what it actually was? It's messages and questions concerning the food chain, human nature, duty, and the sanctity of the planet. Was that even an important part of the equation for viewers? Or was it incessantly praised because it had a couple of really cool fights? Was it because of an unorthodox soundtrack with dubstep music? And even if the reasons for people appreciating this show weren't related to what I perceive as its strongest suits involving its messaging and characters, is it so wrong that this supposed audience got something completely different out of the show than me? Am I just a grumpy elitist who doesn't like the way people are enjoying the media I enjoy? To be frank, I don't have the answer, but I don't really care either. But I can tell you exactly how I feel about this show overall. My final rating for Parasite The Maxim is an 8 out of 10. Parasite isn't perfect, but I still believe it does a lot of things correct. Its story is very tightly written, with Awaki striking a balance that most mangaka simply cannot. He manages to keep the story grounded and believable, all while avoiding writing himself into a corner. The characters are compelling alongside having fantastic dialogue and interactions with one another. And for a TV series animated in 2014, the animation is very good aside from a few reservations I have on CGI use. The soundtrack is surprisingly daring and diverse, managing to fit neatly with the tone of the show. And more so than anything else, I just really fucking enjoy the show and I'm glad I got to experience it once more. I can never truly appreciate the beauty of this anime in my late teens when I originally watched. So writing this analysis piece was therapeutic. Hitoshi Iwaki deserves his flowers. Thank you for watching.